okay, so that's it. Um, thank you so much, Mirko. I think this was really, really good and it was really, really exhaustive. Um, I would now hand over to Professor Simone Kühn, who is leading the Lise Meitner Group in Environmental Neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. She was previously professor in neuroplasticity at the University Hospital Hamburg Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany. She focuses on environmental psychology, neuroscience and behavior and neuroplasticity. And she is very much interested in the question how our environment, for example, green spaces or certain parts of urban features shape our brain. And she uses fMRI scans and other techniques uh, to look at that. And the title of your talk is Testing the Effects of Natural Environments on the Human Brain. And Simone, we're very happy to have you and I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much. Can you see my slides and can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, I mean, apologies, I'm having a flu. So if I start coughing, I'll mute myself and you have to wait for a minute. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, let me try to tell you how I came to this topic. I mean, I mostly did studies which are pretty common in the neurosciences, um, looking at brain plasticity and trying to explore which factors in the environment or mostly lifestyle factors, how do they affect the brain? And all of these, I mean, we've done tons of intervention studies trying to get people to play video games, to do cognitive training and all kinds of things in order to make brain regions grow systematically. And that works pretty well. I mean, better than expected, let's say. But the, the caveat is usually if you stop paying people for this, they stop doing the interventions and be it as fun as it will. I mean, even with those video games, we took off the shelf video games, which are usually highly sold. And even this people stop if they are not being paid anymore. So I've lost the belief that I can greatly change what people do if they don't want to do it deliberately. And therefore, I thought maybe if we would know more about how the environment affects the brain, we could do these things more passively and just put people, I mean, it's also naive, I know, but we could sort of try to change the environment around people without them having to engage really into anything. And that's how my interest developed. Um, Another driving factor is clearly this data that you're probably also well aware of that um, in psychiatry, many psychiatric disorders are seen more frequently in urban areas than in rural areas. And yes, this might be slightly confounded with more psychiatrists being in cities and therefore seeing more patients. But I think there are some studies really suggesting that also if people move, um, the likelihood of them developing um, a psychiatric disorder is um, larger in urban areas compared to rural areas. So there seems to be something about urbanicity that is unhealthy. And um, I think that's somehow also a difficult perspective, that psychiatric one, which has driven much of the research. And I'll try to illustrate um, why I think that's a bit sad. So how do I see the, the what I call environmental neuroscience in the broader field? I mean, there has been loads of, of studies already trying to test how the environment affects mental health or behavior or well-being, as we are talking about now. My feeling is that neurosciences might help us to somehow understand the mechanism, like what, what is actually biologically happening that may explain that link. And I think it's particularly interesting if you look at those pretty common theories. I don't know how... how aware or these how prominent these theories are in your field but this is attention restoration theory that basically assumes that cognitive capacity sort of fatigues over time and that then exposure to green space basically re-improves that cognitive capacity which is oftentimes contrasted with Ulrich's stress recovery theory that mostly um, spells out that nature restores this effective, stressful, this more warm domain of things. And I think that, that neuroscientists could really try to help here, trying to identify which brain regions are actually changing their activity when exposed to nature. Um, so wh whether they, those are more cognitive and more on the cold side or more on the effective side in some way. Um, yeah, as you may know, these methods that we tend to use can, on the one hand, assess brain function and on the other hand, um, assess brain structure, in particular, um, this magnetic resonance um, imaging. And I'll start with some studies looking at brain function. One of the first really, I would call it environmental neuroscientific studies is has been done in Mannheim, where they've recruited participants and, and classified them into living, currently living in rural areas, in towns or in cities. 
And these people underwent a stress paradigm in the scanner. So they were situated in this MRI scanner, did a task where they got false feedback and were thinking I'm doing really bad at this math task and were stressed because of that. And what they found is that in particular, in the comparison of rural versus urban livers, the amygdala, an area here deep down in the brain, was more activated than those people living currently in cities compared to rural livers. And the conclusion they've drawn is basically something in the city livers makes them much more stressed by this external stressor. I mean, it's all a bit post hoc, right? This is a cross-sectional design. <laughs> we don't know what made people live in rural or city areas, but that's one of the first attempts at looking at these differences. Um, another illustration here below shows that if you look at urban uh, early upbringing, so what happened during the first 15 years of life where people there mostly in urban areas or mostly rural areas, there it seems to be that the more urban the, the upbringing was, the bigger the activity was in that stress task here in anterior singlet cortex, also an area known to be responsive to stress which also again indicates those people in cities ha having been brought up in cities are more vulnerable to, to stress. Um, in order to get a bit more causal, we've conducted a, tr a study where we've invited people to the lab, did a so-called faces task with people in the fMRI scanner, where you typically tend to show people fearful or neutral facial expressions. And that is known to elicit amygdala activity simply because we, I mean, the explanation is that we all have learned if somebody looks totally scared, it's better to be scared as well and to start mentally running because it's a, it's a yeah, interesting and important social signal that we are getting if somebody is afraid. And after having done that task in the scanner, we randomly allocated people to a one hour walk either, either in Grunewald in Berlin or in a busy street within Berlin on Schlossstraße. And we got people there by means of a taxi, got them back into the lab and just repeated the same task that we've done before. And we were mostly interested in those brain areas formerly alluded to by this paper I've cited, namely the amygdala. And what we found in that brain area is, here you see the signal before the walk and then after the walk, gray being the people who walked in the urban area, green is the, the people who basically walked in the nature. And as you see, there is a significant decline in signal in amygdala after that walk in, in nature. Interestingly, we find that effect in both conditions, in the fear condition as well as in the neutral condition, which somehow suggests you don't even need to stress people in order to see that effect. It's a very global thing happening, no matter whether you scare them off or don't. What I think is interesting about that study is mostly these prior studies and also the whole psychiatry literature is, is mostly talking about the bad effects of urbanicity. And what we're seeing here is mostly a positive effect of exposure to nature. On the other hand, you may argue most of our participants will most likely be living in urban areas, will be coming to us. And now we are sending them either back into the environment where they came from so that we don't see any additional bad being done to them. So that we cannot exclude. But at least in that design, we, we can clearly show that this greenery has a positive effect. Okay, and now let's move on to brain structure. So that's a bit of a more stable measure, as you may assume, because it's just not that malleable as um, function is, because you can change your brain function pretty rapidly, but not structure. Um, there is really a growing and growing literature looking at what does urban upbringing do to the brain. So those first 15 years that seem to be relevant and that people love to look at also because there is much data suggesting that those first 15 years are a good, I mean, if you, if you spend a lot of time in urban areas during the first 15 years, your likelihood of, of getting a schizophrenia diagnosis if you are at risk is much higher. That's why people love these first 15 years, I think, at least arguing from psychiatry. Um, what I really dislike is the way they, they compute this urbanicity score. They take each year that you've spent in an urban area times three, each year spent in a town times two, and each year spent in a rural region times one, and then sum it all up and call that urbanicity. I find this a very funny way to deal with this. I mean, I see the, the idea of weighing, 
but why is rural a one on an urbanicity scale? Anyways, what has been consistently found is that the longer people spend time in more urban regions um, during the first 15 years, usually you find less prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex, very important brain area, really responsible for all kinds of school tasks, working memory, attention, cognitive control. So um, that would be pretty relevant if it's true. Um, then there has been a study in Barcelona on school children looking at um, green. So not so much focusing on urbanicity, but looking at this vegetation index and finding that the more um, vegetation was in a 100 meter buffer around their upbringing area, the more gray matter they found also in prefrontal cortex. And I was wondering sort of, um, first of all, can we find this in older adults as well? Is that something specific for children? And can we find this in current living as well? Because all these people tend to look at the whole lifespan and we wanted to look at, does that also hold if you look at where people live right now? And um, here we, we took data from the Berlin Aging Study, took different MRI samples, and I don't want to go in depth into this, but looked at what is in a one kilometer radius around their home address, which is roughly within walking distance of people. And what we found is uh, the strongest association between forest and amygdala integrity, suggesting that the more forest you have in a one kilometer radius around your home, the better the structural setup of this amygdala is, which fits nicely to the previous findings. Um, and somehow suggests it, it could also be an acute effect less than a whole upbringing effect. And in a, in a follow-up study of this or on the same data, what we also try to do is um, trying to see um, how is urban fabric and urban green related to brain. And there we also find this is also in the broader context anterior cingulate cortex, the region that I mentioned before. And interestingly here, we find a positive association of that brain area with urban green in your neighborhood and a negative as association with urban fabric, which somehow shows those two are probably on the same continuum. I mean, the less urban fabric you have somewhere, the more chance you have of having urban green there. But interestingly, if you put both into a regression analysis, there is still variance added. So there is more to explain um, next to urban fabric if you enter urban green into the e equation, which to me says there might be something more to urban green than just the absence of city, so to speak. All right, um, and very recently we got a hold on data from um, a Dutch sample, children of 12.5 years of age, who were followed from birth and gave all their home addresses and the exact dates of moving from one place to the other uh, across their life and not in re hindsight, but sort of prospectively. And we, we looked first at how is tree cover density related to brain structure. Um, but this was interestingly negatively correlated to a lot of prefrontal regions. And I was sitting there thinking, man, what is this? I mean, green, we, why, why is that negatively related to all these areas that we know should be positively related? And then I started to explore this further, looking at open green space, because I somehow thought, yeah, tree cover is in so far different to everything that people have done before, because before we've looked at green altogether. I mean, those satellite images look at green everywhere and don't discriminate is the green on top or is the green just on the bottom with a free view, so to speak. Space um, in a buffer around the home address, we do find this positive association with, with lateral prefrontal cortices, but not if we take the trees. And that made me think could it be the fact that trees basically shield your view onto sky? And that's also something that I've always been thinking about this finding that water areas seem to be positive for health and well-being and everything. And I kept thinking that's so much confounded with being able to see the sky. Whenever you see blue, I mean, whereas, where there's water, there's not much above usually, at least in our um, quarters. And um, then we went out to look at Google Street View images. So we took them, segmented them, and sort of um, de derived an, a marker saying, how much sky can you see around the home address of these kids? 
and found that this nicely overlaps with the regions that we find for the open green space. So it has a positive influence or association with prefrontal cortex volume. And if I put all three predictors into a model, so the sky view factor is really the most driving and explanatory factor for this prefrontal um, gray matter volume, which drives me to think it's maybe more about openness and sky than actually green, at least in that particular sample. And that's something I would wish to follow up upon because I really think that might be a fun idea to consider sky as being also a geographical, um, although you can't see it on a map if you just, yeah. In, yeah, anyways, you get what I mean. All right, um, then the other thing is we've now been also talking the whole time about living environments, environments where people spend a lot of time or assumedly at their home address. But we also tried to do a different study where we essentially scanned ourselves. It was most of the scientists because you can't get anybody else to do these studies otherwise. We scanned ourselves for about half a year, a bit longer, about 50 times in a row without any intervention. We just tried to code what we did in the past 24 hours before going into the scanner. That was mostly done, I have to admit, in order to check reliability of the scanner and see how, how what is the natural variation of the, the brain signal that we are getting if we don't run any particular interventions. But one variable that we also assessed that got me interested later is how many hours did you spend outdoors in the last 24 hours? And what we found is that those hours spent outdoors were positively correlated with positive affect. Um, so, I mean, I can't say whether if you are more happy, you tend to go out more or whether going out more makes you happier, but this association exists. And when looking at brain, we also found that um, the, 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 the amount of hours spent outdoors 24 hours before scanning was positively associated to prefrontal gray matter in structure, which to me is striking. I mean, we are looking here at day-to-day -day variations and structure is usually something, I mean, we know it changes more rapidly that, than we long saw it, but that you can see those day-to-day -day variations in a context where people don't do any real intervention is to me really showing that there is, I mean, that, that, that we should better pick what we do each day, right? Because if, if you can even like influence that kind of thing on a day-to-day -day level, I think that's pretty remarkable. And those associations also stay for whatever you control for. You can control for weather, seasonality, how much active people were, like how much they exercised. Um, amount of free time. I mean, we really tried everything. We can't get this association to go away. Um, yeah, and now I would like to come to my last angle of experiments, which is a bit of a different approach. We also try to get participants who to spend time in extreme environments, simply because it's somehow more causal than all these correlational studies. So we've been trying to measure or, or get into the lab people who overwinter on the Neumeier station in Antarctica. And the idea basically came from our early studies. I did a lot of intervention work training people on navigation. And I always thought the ideal situation would be in Antarctica because there are no spatial cues. I mean, these people are in an environment, I mean, not really in the, in the station clearly, but outdoors, there's just no cue. There's just no environment. I mean, there is, but it sort of feels like there are no spatial cues. And, it's pretty much known that spatial navigation is, is absolutely represented and also space is represented in the hippocampus, in particular also in dentate gyrus. And um, our hypothesis was simply that should do something to hippocampus. So we invited these people before and after they went onto that overwintering mission for nine months and took um, a comparison sample of also scientists who didn't go anywhere, basically did, did, did those MR scans before and after, did a few like spatial navigation tasks on the run and found that indeed in line with what we thought, we found decreases in that expedition group in dentate gyrus volume over time. I mean, by now I find these results less compelling because I simply, have, I mean, one has to admit that these people are socially isolated. There are lots of things that are changing except for just taking the environmental cues away. But I mean, on the one hand that tells me nature is not always the good doing thing. So seemingly you can also deprive people by putting them into nature. On the other hand, what was really striking and nice for a neuroscientist to see is we also took BDNF, that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and that thing has been long 
um, like try, I mean, people have always thought that's the driver of neuroplasticity and we can nicely show a decrease in that um, protein, so to speak, and see that the more the, the dentate gyrus here shrinks, um, the more that BDNF thing decreases, which I think is a nice demonstration that these two really go together. We also found some associations to um, decreases in dentate gyrus and worse performance in a navigational task. So I do still believe a bit in that link, but it may also be that we haven't measured isolation well enough to find a link between brain and, and social isolation. But that's at least the direction. Yeah. Ah, Simone, I was just thinking if you could like uh, one more, two more minutes so that we can have a couple of questions. I'm absolutely about to finish. <laughs> we, we, we continue that basically in other sort of analog studies to space flight. So we do bed rest studies, parabolic flight, and those HERA studies where they basically pretend to do missions in, in Houston. Um, just trying to get at sort of weird situations in order to also get that spectrum of brain plasticity in maybe deprivational settings because we do can't do it otherwise, let's say. Yeah, let me sum up. Um, I think what, what our findings so, show so far is that nature exposure may indeed be beneficial in terms of brain health. Um, and it's not only the long-term living environment that seems to have any impact, but also short-term exposures like in our day-to-day -day studies seem to be able to have an impact on brain structure. Um, I think that, I mean, I'm, we are running lots of studies now trying to look at sky, um, and my theory somehow is that sky might be important, maybe also due to light exposure, vitamin D, and all these depression links. Um, and I would just want to encourage you to maybe also think about sky if you're, you're thinking about water <laughs> areas. And, sorry. And um, natural environments as this um, normalization may also be detrimental and not just strictly speaking positive that the more natural it is, the more positive um, that area is for people. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Simone. Fascinating. So then are there any questions? I think, I think Simone, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be great. Uh, I think the first one was Andrew. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm sorry, we, I'm not sure we know each other, but um, I found your work extremely interesting. Um, I'm just wondering whether part of the effect from sky and forests might be through air particulates. In other words, through the quality of the air. Um, we know that uh, memory is strongly linked to the prefrontal cortex. And certainly I've had a hand in a study and there are others finding that uh, air particulates are bad for the memory, speaking loosely. So uh, I wonder if, could you run an experiment where you ruin the air in the uh, brain science lab? And also more broadly, could, could that be the key driving force here, Simone? Um, yes, could well be. I mean, I'm currently trying to get a hold of all these large scale, like we have a German national cohort study where they do lots of brain scanning. And I think these bigger sample sizes will somehow allow us to look at more um, explanatory variables on the environment side at the same time to get a hold on. I mean, I know these things are all highly correlated. Why wouldn't they? But I think um, using like regular re regression models might help us to identify like what, what the cause really is. I've also been thinking about air pollution, but it's just really not, not clear. There are a few studies out there that uh, pretty much show this. We've been thinking and starting a few studies where we expose people to smoke and then look at, um, I mean, regular cigarette smoke, because it's just a nice way, I think, of exposing people to something and at the same time being ethical in explaining to them what they are exposed to and also sort of giving them a natural measurement of how bad is it. I mean, I'm just going to say that's going to be two cigarettes in that room. Um, yeah, and that's, that's I, I think, the only way of ethically exposing people systematically. But, um, and the data simply shows there are cognitive deficits. I mean, people do suffer from, from that kind of exposure. I think long-term studies really manipulating air pollution is difficult, but we, we, we try to do our best in, in assessing air pollution as well right now, yeah. Okay, I think next one was Ganga. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if you have any decision tasks in your experiments um, and do you see if the exposure changes decision making as well? 
right now we haven't and i got much more aware of i mean i, I was very a lonesome writer, writer in my field because neuroscientists don't do what i do and i wasn't aware of the rest of the field but I, I by now really see the potential of not looking just at how environment affects humans but how humans actions affect back on the environment i mean i knew that before but i wasn't yet totally aware of it so that would be a totally interesting add-on to get more in in what directions that that two yeah. boxes in track let's say yeah i think the the reason i was asking is because cities actually pull in a lot of people and that's because they offer a lot of other things like a social life work opportunities etc um which are so different from rural areas in some cases not all so in that context i wonder if some of the effects can be explained away by the positive affect people get from being in a city um yeah, we are also more and more thinking about how to assess neighborhood self-selection better because I think that would greatly help us. But I think it's just very hard to do. So now our goal is to do twin studies, uh, recruiting monozygotic twins, looking at where, I mean, they still show us where to live, but one can at least assume that many of the early factors are sort of identical almost. Um, yeah. Um, next one is George. Thank you. Yeah, no, I found that really fascinating. And this thing about the sky um, and blue spaces, I guess, you know, blue spaces, both water and above the water, um, comes out in our ESM uh, research, as I guess I'll mention later. Um, and also, you know, this question actually in the chat, uh, we find kind of strong effects of, uh, you know, sunny and unobscured skies uh, on people's immediate um, happiness and relaxation. Um, so now that's a really interesting direction. And my other question was just some of this stuff about kind of brain development and cities. Is there a chance that some of this kind of comes from, you know, my understanding is that, you know, leaded petrol was, you know, being you know, lead being spewed out into the environment when I was growing up. And I, my understanding is there's still kind of quite high levels of lead in many cities uh, from that legacy. Is there a chance that it's, it's some of it is related to that too? I don't think so. I mean, we've been trying to go into that direction and um, the lead exposure that you can at least show in German samples are massively low by now. I don't know how it is in other countries, but I was, I mean, I was struck by all these pollutants being extremely low in the blood. I, I was really setting up for this because I thought that might be a good reason. I think it's getting lower and lower and even more so in the younger generations. It's it's surprisingly lit, but we, we're trying and collaborating with somebody who does um, also post-mortem analyses of brains in terms of pollutants that still are in the brain um, to derive like acids that we can then do in the blood from substances that we know land in the brain. But um, those concentrations are ex surprisingly small by now. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should do two more. There is Arthur first. Arthur? Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Kuhn, for your uh, very interesting presentation. I had a question which might be a bit of a stretch, but it, it just made me think of that because I have an essay to write uh, and I'm thinking of some possible solutions. Um, and basically you're saying that uh, all of these green aspects, uh, the sky as well, can have a very positive es like effect on brain structures, but also on, on the, the emotions that those people are, are experiencing. I was wondering if, if we would put more green spaces and we would, for instance, reduce the height of buildings in our cities, would it help to change people's attitude towards climate change and maybe make them more aware and more motivated to actually act. Very difficult to say. I can only say we try to do studies where we take 3D modeled um, scenes and basically try to either increase the amount of green in those pictures or decrease the amount of city that you see, I mean, build houses, because even that I don't yet understand because having more green in the visual field usually means seeing less of the city behind or the houses and whatever. And even this to me is unclear. I know, I mean, we know from many studies that if you increase the green part on pictures, on the very same pictures, you tend to find positive effects on cognition. So the more green is on the picture, the better people recover from, from cognitive strain afterwards. But I, frankly speaking, don't know whether it's due to more green or less. I mean, you cover up the city and therefore might, it might just be the city that you're 
decreasing. So even there, I think there is not much known what it actually is, whether it's more green, less urban, or what what on that dimension, what it is. So I would not dare to yet stretch it in any way. Like you need to plant four trees in the neighborhood of everybody and then people will, will behave more environmentally friendly. I mean, I'd love us to get there sometime soon. And I really think this, this research can have that kind of impact. And I'd love to collaborate with, with um, economists in, in order to be able to like quantify it because I think that would make it really sexy to have. I mean, I don't know why people love these brain images. I do because I do this, but I really think that could make a convincing story having brain <laughs> and then also the uh, the amount of trees you need to change in order to achieve whatsoever. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, very quick last question, Chris. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess, uh, have you looked at the, returning back to lead-based paint, have you looked at the studies in America on lead-based paints? Um, because at least the things I've seen is that there are diminishingly small levels, but that even those diminishingly small levels can have like relatively outsized effects, especially when you're incredibly young. So that might be an interesting way to dig into that side of things that lead-based paint, especially in poor neighborhoods in America versus poor neighbors in America that don't have lead-based paint issues or making that distinction. If that would be possible to do group studies, I, I, I would very much think you could get a hold of this better than the way that we've done, like correlational and with very, very low intensities. <laughs> yeah, but interesting point. I'll, I'll look into this. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think it was fascinating and a very good start of the workshop. Um, we do have a break now until four o'clock and um, let's get a coffee and see you in 15 minutes.